The violins. Did you see the violins play at the beginning? Let me check. We'll do it again. Here we go. Let's check. We'll just do that over here again. Have a look and see if the violins are playing. And one. Were the violins playing? No, it's okay. They want to, but they're not allowed. <laughs> they're not going to play. Okay. It's viola. Say viola. viola. Stand up, violas, please. The violas are very special. They really are. They're the beautiful, beautiful colour. So they've got something different from all the other strings. Let's listen again. Here we go. And right on C. And. So we put all the strings together and tell me what's special about the violas. Here we go. And. What's special about the violas? Yes. They're louder and slower. They're louder and slower. Good. <clears throat> Something else. Yes. That's not a comment, ladies and gentlemen. That's right here, Rika. Though you're absolutely right. They're louder. And something else. Yes. They're playing the melody. That's right. We're going to close our eyes and I'm going to ask one of the instruments, the basses, the cellos or the bassoons to play and you have to tell me which one it was. Eyes closed, hands over eyes. Here we go. And eyes open. Which instrument was it? The bassoons, that's right. Who agrees it was the bassoons? Hands up. Well done. Eyes closed. Eyes closed. And here we go. Yes? It was the bassoons again. It was the bassoons again. That's right. This is contemporary orchestration, right? And in the curriculum, what do they call it when they have players doing all sorts of weird things like, they call it playing on the bridge or whatever, what do they refer to that in the syllabus or the curriculum, do you know? When you're writing outside the norm. In the syllabus it's called extended techniques. Do you have that term down here? Yes, extended, do they have that term, Jenny, extended techniques? There are some, it's a crazy term because every composer extends the technique somewhere along the line. And I'm going to give you an example. Cellos, will you just play a G, your open G, please. Now for years, cellos just did that so <laughs> they did right so and friends in the opera like if I asked someone to do it, play a G would you play a G please Ron? va bene stasera la luna no, down to a C down to a C va bella giorno back to the G va G and people thought, wow, that's cool. And then Monteverdi came along and said, I'm over that. I'm going to ask you to do this, cellos. Da 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 Here we go, cellos on the G's. And three and four. And duck it, 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 duck it. And what did the cellos do? What do you reckon? They went on strike. They did, they went on strike. Truly. It was in combatimento. And the violins were playing. Ya da 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 da. We just do a G major scale like that. Violins and one and two and ya ba 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 da 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 da. And the seconds went ya da 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 da. And the first went up. So we have a contrary motion. And we have da 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 three and four and da 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 da. And the violas went on a D. Ba da 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 da. Here we go, violas, and three, and four, and And the cellos led the strike. They walked, they were not strike. And Monteverdi, that's when Monteverdi wrote the famous document, little page. And he said, we have three things in music, we have now discovered a third. The first was that which is pensive, that is music which we think about that doesn't really deal with an emotion. The next is pastoral, which deals with outdoor things. 
and life that is extraneous. But we don't have a music which is intensely emotional. And he wrote this piece called The Combatimento of Tancredi and Clorinda, which deals with a Christian fighting a Muslim. But they don't know that one is a girl and one is a boy. And they meet at a well. And they look at each other, they have their masks off. She's a Muslim and he's a Christian. They look at each other and what happens when they meet at the well? What do you reckon, Abe? They fall in love, as you do, okay, <laughs> going to the well. So they then, they fall in love and they, they depart. They put their mask back on and they ride in a different way. So if, to do that, Monteverdi did this. Can we just have G's again? So just open G's. Everyone playing an open G. And we're going to go one, two, three. One, two, and. D, da, da. So Monteverdi did that. He called that the motto di cavallo, the movement of the horse, and the players were beside themselves. <laughs> They'd never done anything which had tempo changes and metre changes. And then when they got to this, the principal cello said, we, we can't play anymore. And Monteverdi said, fine. I will find someone who can. <laughs> Guess what? They all turned up. They all turned up. And the piece lasted for 17 minutes. And it changed the course of operatic thinking, that piece, that one 17 minute piece. And it's reported that at the end, audience was on the floor weeping at the incredible intensity of the singers. Because what happens is, Monteverdi, uh, uh, Clorinda and Tancredi fight, but they don't know who the other is. They just know they're warriors fighting. And he kills her and takes off the mask and realises oh, it's the person he loves. Not a happy ending, guys. <laughs> Not happy. <laughs> that was a really important thing because there was a rule about operas later that they all had to be happy. In the 18th century, you couldn't go into a German opera house with a sad opera. So Monteverdi wrote that. Then he wrote another piece about horrible people called Papaya, in which not one character is good. They're all vile, evil people, except Seneca. Now, the reason I'm saying that is he changed musical thought. He changed musical thought, how people thought about music. And composers are still trying to find ways of how do we change things? What do we do? Okay, let's just play the last chord, guys, the last bar. There's an instrument that dominates the sound, just the last bar, and. What do you reckon? Anyone over here? The piccolo. Now, piccolos are dynamite, okay? We love them to bits, we love piccolos, but there's a time when you could say, don't do that, right? <laughs> and that's one of them, because everybody goes deaf, everybody goes, oh my God, that piccolo texture, everybody goes, mmm, the whole orchestra does that. They do, and you can tell by their eyes. Now, thank you. The harp. Let's, would you mind doing that little passage? Um, Bronwyn, in the harp, he's given G flat, D natural, E flat. Is that all helpful? It is. Do you mean at 43? Yes, at 43. It tells me what pedal configuration to use. So in the harp part, if you're not sure about harp writing, speak to a harpist, because what harpists tend to do is rewrite all their parts. It doesn't matter who wrote it. The people they don't rewrite are Debussy, Ravel and Puccini. Richard Strauss they have to rewrite entirely. He didn't have a clue. And it's true, he didn't. And they, you have to rewrite every harp part of Strauss. And the harpists go insane, rewriting parts. And the harp is a really interesting instrument because the harp is at home in C flat major. 
That's the harp's natural territory. I think that's right, isn't it, Bronwyn? C flat, we're happy in C flat. So, and that's the pedals will keep changing that. Now, that's a, not life changing information, but it's good trivia. So, <laughs> if anyone ever asks you about the harp. So, let's listen to what the harp does just at that point at 43. Now, there are three things the harp does that are interesting. One is the glissando. That's, that's happy harp. Glissando, happy harp. This one, not happy harp. And then even less happy, boom, harmonic up there after going that forever. And so the harp now hates the arranger. And that's all good. And which do you think is the most useful instrument in the orchestra? And there is one. The most useful. A really, really, really useful instrument. It's the French horn. Because the four of them have an extraordinary range and the French horn will go with anything. If you want to double an instrument, you've got a piccolo, French horn will do it. Double bass, French horn will do it. The French horn is like orchestral glue. They will hold everything together. The horn textures are, I'm not trying to make the horns feel happy, it's true. <laughs> and the composer who thought about that most was Brahms. Brahms wrote some really interesting stuff for horn, solo violin and flute in octaves. Really interesting how composers experiment with this sort of thing. Guys, I know it's not cool to answer questions, but why do we go to school? Why do we go to school? There's only two reasons for going to school. Carmen? Learning. That's the first. And the second is? Not just learning, but learning what? Learning how to learn. And what's the second reason? Learning how to think. End. They have the two reasons we go to school. Is that clear? Good, what's your name? Carl. Carl, it's clear, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> when I ask you a question, what am I encouraging you to do? Answer. Answer and think. Think. Does it matter if it's wrong? No, who cares? Why? If it's wrong, who cares? And if it's wrong, we can learn something from it. Do you get that, guys? Okay? And I don't give in, do I, Jack? <laughs> no. I'm a real pest. When you hear the violas and cellos together, it's so beautiful. Let's hear the violas alone. On. Now let's hear the cellos alone. Two beautiful sounds. Put those two beautiful sounds together. So when you're writing for instruments and you're composing for instruments, think about how different instruments will work together like that. Writing for two flutes or two clarinets. And these sounds are so beautiful. Beethoven teaches us such a lot about how terribly simple things can make really good music. <laughs> Listen to this, guys. This is Beethoven. This, this man, Beethoven, was, in my view, an extraordinary inventor. And what made him extraordinary was his capacity to take the tiniest idea and keep building. So you remember how we started? Listen to what's happened over here. Seconds, violas, cellos and basses and let us see. And two. That 
music rocks <laughs> in the best sense of the word. It really does. It's very beautiful. And it, you can feel it go, He loved those cross effects. And it's made even stronger when the winds say, no, dee, da, da, da. It goes like that. And they say, no, it doesn't. It goes, and then somebody wins. So all this energy that came over here now moves over here and it becomes really calm and we hear all these beautiful tunes and what are these people over here doing? Boom, 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 boom. They stay with the argument that they started. So when you're writing your music and that's why we learn music, we learn music so we can make our own music. That's why we do it at school. Not just playing instruments, that's wonderful, we love playing instruments. Singing, we love singing, that's all really important. But the most important thing is making your own. The composer of this piece is a man called Gordon Hamilton and he's still alive unlike Beethoven. And he wrote this piece for Miss Paulson. And he wrote a big cello solo, which we're going to do right now. So we're going to go from 82. Okay. So, well, would you play a little bit of it to just refresh our memories of the solo? Give this person a big clap.